Thanks, Leho. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, the hashtag is CXL Live, and I am at Roger Dooley, if you happen to be tweeting. Um, any Agent Carter fans here? OK, well, uh, I'm not a fan. Uh, for, for many years, I had no difficulty dominating the search results for my name, Roger Dooley. Uh, but then Disney and Marvel, in their wisdom, saw fit to uh, name this other character, Roger Dooley. That is not me in the middle. That's Shea Wiggum. He's an actor. But he is now my competition for my own name. So uh, your digital marketers will appreciate that. Uh, now, the next slide, I have a, a little bit of a problem putting up uh, because we've just heard about Bart's entire family history being psychologists. But well, just as Leo mentioned, uh, I write neuromarketing blog. I've been doing that for nearly 12 years now. Uh, and a few years ago, Wiley bought up my book, book Brainfluence, which is now in about eight languages. And that's why Pep invited me here to speak. But the next slide uh, gives me some concern because we've heard uh, about uh, Bart's family being all psychologists. We've got some really great other psychologists on the speaker list today. But uh, this provocative question, is psychology really all bullshit? And it's not a fanciful question, because three years ago, here we go, uh, Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner, said he saw a train wreck coming in the field of psychology research, and in particular in the area of priming research. And in fact, just late last year, a study came out uh, that tried to reproduce 100 psych psychology experiments and was able to reproduce only 39 out of 98, which isn't a real good number, uh, since uh, I know that I cited a lot of these studies in my book, and uh, certainly many uh, famous people are okay, uh, affected by this. I'm not going to get into the statistics. Some of it is publication bias. It isn't that all these people are frauds. But uh, we've got people like Amy Cuddy. You've probably seen her video of her Wonder Woman pose. Uh, is, it's a priming effect. John Barg, famous scientist, done some brilliant work on priming. I quote him a lot in my book. Uh, and uh, evolutionary psychologists uh, have also uh, come under fire for romantic priming or mating priming as being very hard to reproduce research. Uh, so uh, I'm going to. Uh, we may see a redemption this year. There's apparently a paper coming out to refute last year's paper. But uh, I think one takeaway from all this uh, is, no, psychology is not all bullshit. But you should, as with any other kind of recommendation, test and not assume it's going to work in your particular situation just because some really smart person, to, or even I, told you to. So let me get, throw out a few statistics. Uh, next year, uh, app revenue is supposed to hit around $270 billion, a lot of money. But according to Gartner, only uh, one out of about 10,000 apps will actually be financially successful over the next few years. Uh, E-commerce, almost $1.7 trillion last year. Huge number, but not as big as the $4 trillion that was left in abandoned e-commerce shopping carts. And the takeaway from this is that we are not very good at persuasion. I could give you all kinds of other statistics about 98% uh, of direct mail doesn't work and 95% of new products fail. But what we really need is a revolution. And in fact, we've got one. Uh, for millennia, people assumed that the universe revolved around the Earth. Uh, and then uh, Galileo and Copernicus perhaps came along and showed that the Earth was actually a pretty small factor in the grand scheme of things, even in our own solar system. And so for the same number of millennia, uh, people have assumed that the conscious mind was the center of human behavior. And as uh, John Bard, who I mentioned a moment ago, so eloquently put it, just as uh, Galileo took the Earth out of the center of the uh, universe, uh, so has modern science uh, now taken the conscious mind out of the center of human behavior. And um, there's all kinds of splits as far as how much behavior is conscious and how much isn't. Uh, the one I tend to use comes from Gerald Zaltman at Harvard, 
uh, which is that only 5% of our processes, decision-making processes, are conscious, and 95% are non-conscious. And whatever that exact number is, uh, the key takeaway is that if you are primarily focusing on features, benefits, price, uh, and those very uh, sort of rational, logical factors, you're addressing a very small part of your customer's brain. And uh, so how do you address the non-conscious parts? Uh, you've all heard of Robert Cialdini and his uh, six principles of influence, things like social proof and reciprocity. We just heard about the fog behavior model from Near. Uh, the, uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, in his System 1 and System 2, Bart talked about, uh, uh, these are all different ways of looking uh, at that uh, non-conscious behavior. Evolutionary psychology uh, is a fascinating area. The uh, leading proponent of that, Jeffrey Miller, wrote a, a really fascinating book called Spent that shows how much of our modern consumer behavior is actually driven by programs that were created tens of thousands of years ago in our hunter-gatherer days. It makes a convincing case. Uh, there are all kinds of behavior researchers out there, people like Dan Ariely, Adam Alter, many others, who are doing all kinds of interesting experiments, hopefully reproducible ones, that shed light on specific aspects of human behavior that we can then apply as marketers. Uh, and lastly, uh, we've got this whole new area of technology that's opened up just in the last 10 or 20 years involving brain imaging, where we can actually put people in an fMRI machine and see what's going on inside their head while they are viewing content, viewing ads, looking at products, uh, and making decisions. Uh, the quick point I'd make after giving you the uh, uh, little digest of psychology there is that uh, there's no one theory that is going to be uh, explain all behavior or is going to be totally useful for you. You're going to need to find those bits and pieces from each of these theories that work in your particular situation. Um, and uh, how many people have been in a meeting like this where you're trying to figure out what to put on a landing page or a home page or in an advertisement, and you've got people who want to talk about features and specifications, and someone else wants to say, well, we need to really emphasize how low the price is. And then you've got maybe somebody who says, well, we need some social proof or authority in there. Uh, and all these competing viewpoints, sometimes this can even happen in your own head because you can't put everything you want on a page. And uh, what, what I did to help uh, try and sort out some of this, this tension between the conscious factors and non-conscious factors is to, uh, I created a little slide, uh, a little metaphor called the persuasion slide. And it's a relatively simple concept, and it's designed, as I said, to bring in these psycho psychological factors uh, into a model based on the very simple child's playground slide. And there's only four components to it. Uh, very simple, I'm gonna go through them really quickly, but each element has a conscious and a non-conscious element, and if you think about it in that kind of organized way, you can at least make some informed choices. It may still be hard to choose which items finally go into your marketing, but at least you're forcing yourself to think about them. Uh, gravity is your customer's initial motivation. Uh, that's what they come to you with. Uh, you don't provide it, uh, that's their needs, their wants, their desires, which may be conscious or they may even be sort of subconscious. Uh, you are fighting gravity when you tell a customer to, to do something for you, fill out my form, whatever. Uh, you say, who would do that? Well, this is, this is a, something I had uh, not too long ago. It's a copy editing site, and I wanted more information about their services. And in order to find out this information, I was supposed to give up my information and click a button that said, place an order. Now, that didn't make any sense to me, so I, I didn't do it. Uh, but if you're working with gravity, uh, you'll convert far better. Uh, Ramit Sethi, who uh, actually is a Stanford guy and studied under B.J. Fogg, uh, is now a successful internet marketer, and uh, his site is IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com. Uh, so people who show up there are probably interested in getting more money. Why else would you? So he's making, telling them uh, that uh, if they give their information to him, he will show them how to make 10K in 10 minutes. Sounds preposterous, but it aligns with that customer's gravity. Uh, the second component of the slide is the nudge. When a little kid is at the top, uh, either mom or dad has to give them a shove or they have to propel themselves forward with their arms and get themselves moving down the slide. Uh, and it, in our model, it can take many forms. It could be an email in an inbox, a physical sales call, a phone call, a pop-up ad, a search ad, a uh, very visible call to action on a landing page. All of those are potential nudges. Uh, but here's, look, keeping uh, in line with that subscription uh, offer model, here's 
a blog that has a terrible nudge. It's their nudge to subscribe is this wee little icon uh, that looks like an envelope that nobody's gonna see or even know what it is if they do happen to notice it. Uh, compare that to uh, what Chris Brogan does, a uh, very savvy marketer. On every content page on his site, a third of the visible area uh, above the fold is a nudge to subscribe. It has this picture, it has a very visitor-focused message. It says, uh, you want to grow your business. Uh, so it's um, uh, very simple, and nobody is gonna miss that. But even if they, if they do miss it, then he nudges them again with a light box pop-up that again has a very focused message saying, I'm giving you my best stuff for free. Uh, so again, aligning with their needs because typically it's entrepreneurs and people looking to market better that come to his site. And you cannot go to his site without being nudged at least a couple of times. So uh, the nudge has to be seen and it has to start that process going. Uh, because if it doesn't start the process, if there's no motivation at all in the nudge, uh, then it doesn't work. Uh, and LinkedIn has a great method for nudging you. They put your photo in an ad. So you can't really not look at the ad to see what it's doing in there. And they pull it from your profile picture, of course. Uh, but in this case, they said you might want to follow Comcast. Well, why? I'm not even in their territory. I don't really care about them. Uh, they nudged me, and it was effective. It got my attention, but they provided zero motivation. So needless to say, I did not convert. Um, the next part of the slide is motivation. And this is perhaps the most interesting area because it is totally under your control. This is the motivation that you're providing. Uh, and you can use conscious motivators, things like discounts, gifts. You can tell them about your features. You can tell them about the benefits they'll get. Uh, uh, all of these are designed to appeal to their logical decision-making mind. Uh, you can also use non-conscious motivators, things like emotions, things like uh, uh, psychological triggers, co uh, cognitive biases that some people call brain bugs. And uh, in a typical marketing situation, whether it's a landing page, a website, an ad, you're gonna to wanna to include both conscious and non-conscious motivators. The, some of the conscious motivators that you'll commonly see are uh, a customer benefit, how much money they'll save, how powerful the product is, the, uh, whether there's a guarantee or not. Uh, gifts and discounts are extremely common. If you're trying to get a subscriber to your newsletter, you'll probably offer them an ebook or a free video or something of that nature. Uh, in retail, the most uh, powerful motivator uh, is the sale, uh, and virtually all retailers use that. Uh, and we had a great uh, example, of sort of an A-B experiment here carried out on a s massive scale by J.C. Penney a few years ago. What uh, they did, uh, they decided to stop the insanity of pricing and go with everyday low pricing and uh, continue to advertise. They would send out their weekly flyers or newspaper ads, uh, but they would simply have everyday low prices. Uh, much simpler for them, much simpler for the consumer, and their sales absolutely tanked compared to their competition. Uh, they were in danger of going out of business until they canned their CEO. Because what was happening was, uh, without discounts, the customers were continuing to be nudged, but there was no motivation to act, and they did not act in great numbers. Uh, so the new CEO came in and immediately went back to a heavy-duty sale policy. Uh, this is their home page. It changes every couple of days, but now uh, every time I've gone there, it's been 100% sales all the time. Now, the problem with these kinds of motivators is uh, they cost money. You can get more sales if you offer free shipping, but it costs something. So do discounts. So do building additional features into your product. Uh, and on the other hand, if you can use non-conscious motivators, uh, they are free because typically you're changing design and copy, and uh, they can be even more effective often than the conscious motivators are. Uh, let me take a quick uh, detour here. Do we have any pet owners in the room? Okay, a lot, a lot of you folks are pet owners. Well, this, this is my little puppy uh, a few years ago. He was a rescue, and he was kind of funny looking. Let's see if we can see how funny looking he actually is here. There we go. Uh, <laughs> And so we, we decided to name him after a comedian, Conan O'Brien. Well, we had no idea how big he was going to get because he was just this wee little thing. But uh, uh, he kind of grew and grew, and eventually he resembled the other Conan a little bit more. Uh, now he's about 80 pounds and thinks he's a human, sits pretty much uh, wherever he wants. But uh, all in all, it's been a really rewarding experience to have him, and I know our lives are a lot richer because he's part of the family. Now, what I've done uh, with that little detour is uh, 
create what Cialdini would call a liking effect by showing what I have in common with you. Uh, and you can do this too in your marketing. Uh, PetSmart does a really nice job of this uh, on their about page where instead of a bunch of uh, really stiff looking dudes in suits, uh, they're all holding these big fluffy cats and dogs, they're smiling. Uh, I don't know if those are really their pets or if they rented them for the photo shoot. Maybe they got them at a taxidermy shop, but they are, they are showing their customers that we are like you, we have this in common with you, and you can trust us to take care of your pets. Uh, the only thing I would say is put those liking cues where people can see them on your landing page, on your home page, uh, in your ad, wherever it is, uh, not bury it uh, on your about page that only one person in a thousand is actually going to see. Uh, let's talk about social proof uh, for a second. We all know what that is. How many, we have so many customers, so many subscribers. Uh, but you may not know uh, that there are different kinds of social proof. And uh, there is action versus preference. Now, this is a fairly recent study you just wrote about uh, that uh, you can use, say, people ordered or people preferred, people viewed or people liked. And obviously, you have to do this honestly. You can't just make stuff up. But uh, there, you would expect that an action is more persuasive than just an expressed emotion. Uh, in fact, what this study found, uh, and they did a uh, split test that compared the click-through rate if uh, the social proof was in the form of views, which is an action, or in likes, which is simply a, an expression of preference. And in fact, the likes were more persuasive. Uh, and so the same thing happened for ordered versus preferred. So if you can, try testing uh, a preference-based social proof instead of just an action-based social proof. Uh, uh, decoy marking is one of my favorite topics. There's a lot of ways you can do this. We're only going to look at one here, which is uh, an appliance uh, maker who had two, or an uh, appliance seller, uh, had two versions of a product they were selling, a good one and then a better one. And they were, sales were about equally divided. They wanted to increase sales in that category, so they introduced a super whiz-bang model uh, at the high end, uh, hoping uh, that it would help. In fact, it They'd sold very few of that product, but they, what they found was uh, now the previously high-end product was a compromised product, and it seemed like a middle-of-the-road choice to people, and the sales of that product went way up, and their revenue did, in fact, increase, although not from, directly from the fancy model. So uh, by adding a more expensive product to your line, if you have a product with various versions or multiple products, uh, you can increase sales of the lower-level products. Now, here's a uh, software product I bought a few years ago. I think their pricing model has changed now. But this company wanted to sell the pro version of their software, uh, and, which was $199. And they did something that I thought was pretty smart. Uh, they, yeah. they introduced uh, an ultimate version for $499 and positioned it ahead of it. Uh, now, I don't think, I don't know this for a fact. If you have anybody from the company in here, you can clarify that. But I don't think they sold a ton of those 499s but it made the 199 now look like a much more reasonable sort of middle of the road choice. And the other smart thing they did was uh, they started with the big number on the left. Since most of us in this room read from left to right, uh, that's the first number you'll process and that'll be an anchoring effect and the subsequent prices will look lower. I don't know about you, but probably three quarters of the pricing pages like this I see start with the free or basic version on the left and then escalate up as you read across. Uh, I would, if you're doing that, Try testing it flipped and see if it helps. Uh, we've already heard about uh, FOMO and scarcity, scarcity being one of Cialdini's six principles uh, and a related topic, urgency. Uh, travel sites are great at doing that. There's only two rooms left at this price, only three seats at this price on the airplane. Uh, and uh, they will uh, even show how many have sold in the last few hours to try and create that sense of urgency so you'll convert immediately. Uh, these guys are very sophisticated at conversion. Uh, so uh, follow, just check out the things they do sometimes and emulate them, I, probably good for you. But you, even if you don't have a product in limited supply, you can create your own scarcity by having an offer that expires at a certain time, by making only a certain quantity available at a price for and during a sale. Uh, and uh, one way that you might not have thought about creating this sort of urgency and scarcity effect is uh, by putting a timer on your page. Uh, this test came from Witch Test 1, and 
they found that adding this little line of text at the bottom, hopefully you can see that in the back of the room, but there's this little timer thing that says, ordered within uh, a certain number of hours and minutes uh, to get next day delivery. And they found that actually increased conversion. And I would think if that is a moving timer, I've certainly seen uh, sites with other kinds of countdown timers, uh, that would also uh, attract the visual attention of the visitor. So something to test would be putting some kind of a timer on a page. Now, uh, all of you folks are faced with design choices, uh, and many of these you might relegate to a designer, right? It's, it's a design issue, but sometimes they can have a big impact. Uh, here's a price, and here's a price. Uh, they look the same, and they are the same if you are selling to women. If you are selling to men, the price in red will look like about twice as big of a discount uh, as the same price in black. Uh, women are mostly unaffected by that, apparently, being the more intelligent gender. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, this price and this price are the same mathematically, but the one on the bottom, for many people, will look lower. The reason is uh, a group of researchers found that we subconsciously sound out prices in our brain. So if there's more zeros and digits and punctuation, uh, it will actually uh, seem like a slightly bigger price, even though objectively it's the same price. Uh, another experiment asked people to taste tomato soup and give their evaluation of it. Uh, half the people saw it with a sign next to it that had tomato soup in this courier font, sort of a plain typewriter font. Uh, the other half uh, saw it in the uh, more attractive, elegant Lucinda font. Uh, the people who saw the soup in Lucinda found, of course it was the exact same soup, were more like, they liked it better, and they were twice as likely to say they would buy that. So very inconsequential design choice, apparently, but having a big impact on the actual perception of the product. Uh, I could go on and on, but uh, Pep said I couldn't have three hours. So I'd encourage you to read some of the great books on the topic, uh, and there are uh, lots of others. There are a lot of great blogs out there. Uh, the Conversion XL blog does a lot of psychology stuff. So. Uh, read and find those things that you can incorporate into your testing program. The last element of the slide, and perhaps my favorite, is friction. Uh, you're probably all familiar with the concept of friction, uh, but there's actually two kinds. There's real and perceived uh, friction, or imaginary friction, as I call it. Uh, the real friction uh, that you're uh, you encounter are things like too many form fields, uh, how many steps you have in the checkout process, confusing stuff where the user just doesn't know what to do, uh, bad user experience, and so on. Uh, anything in the conversion sequence can be friction. But uh, the, uh, uh, here's an example of an orphan. I clicked on a link in my email to read an article. It's, the title of the article was, it sounded interesting, and I got this form. It's got like 12 boxes on it, and it's asking things like, do you have a solution? When are you going to invest in a solution? You know, never. I don't even know what the solution is for. So I did what most people do, and I hit the back button because I did not want to read the article that badly. It wasn't that important to me. Staples invented the easy button, right? Uh, not long ago, I went to check out. I put a, an ink cartridge thingy for my printer in my shopping cart and went to check out, and I'm a Staples customer, and I saw this form. And the reason you can't see the form or read it is because I had to paste together five screens just to fit it on the slide. Those grayish areas there are instructions telling me what to do, I guess. Uh, I got to this form uh, and I said, Office Max is eight minutes away. I'm just jumping in my car and getting <laughs> the ribbon, the ink. And, and I did, and I also contributed in my small way to the $4 trillion in abandoned shopping carts because that's right where I left it. Uh, Amazon totally gets friction. Uh, they have, for their prime customers in particular, uh, have eliminated friction from the ordering process. Uh, when you're on a page looking at a product, you can immediately see what the product's gonna cost you, when you'll get it for no shipping cost. Shipping cost is kind of a frictional element too. Uh, you will know where it's going to if you have multiple addresses, and all you have to do is click that single button. And they don't have a, an abandoned shopping cart problem because that order is going direct from your brain to your finger to their fulfillment system. Uh, and that's why they're the biggest e-commerce retailer. Uh, you may find uh, even hidden uh, friction in your user experience that unless you actually go through the process yourself mimicking a uh, not very swift customer that you would never even see. Uh, I was trying to get the takeout menu for the Chili's that's about five minutes from my house. 
Uh, and I, so I went there and I had to put in my zip code to find the restaurant. Uh, and instead of the zip code popping up, I'm logged in in Chrome, I should know how to fill in a zip code for me. I find out that for some reason, the brilliant designers had disabled automated form filling for this, so I had to physically type it in. Now it's only five digits, but why on earth would you do that on a restaurant locator page? You know, this isn't uh, Fort Knox here. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, one effort of Google's has been to uh, make filling forms and auto completion an easier task, and that's something you need to do too. If you have forms, which probably most of you do have on your site, be sure that uh, they can be auto-filled uh, with the greatest ease possible. And now security is huge these days. Uh, the, uh, but security czars are taking over companies where they are defining uh, security and the people responsible for conversion uh, sometimes don't have a voice. So now they're creating these passwords, uh, requiring passwords that nobody can remember. They are uh, expiring the passwords. Uh, they're making it very difficult to do business uh, with uh, them. Uh, that is not really a uh, good way to go. And obviously, uh, some security is essential, but uh, in your role as marketers, you have to push back to be sure they're not overdoing it. Uh, automatic logouts are plaguing me lately. We've got, uh, uh, I leave a site for five minutes to take a phone call, and suddenly I find uh, I've been logged out, and whatever I was in the middle of, I've got to log back in, navigate through the site, and restart. Uh, you need to step, check every step of your conversion process. Again, make, make some mistakes along the way and see what people are really finding. Uh, now, the imaginary portion of friction is uh, the fun part, because this isn't real friction, but it can have a huge impact on your conversion rates. Uh, Words and names that are hard to say are perceived as being difficult and risky. So when you're choosing a brand name, uh, a domain name or whatever, uh, you want as fluent, as easy to say a name as possible. Um, Adam Alter, uh, psychologist, did a great study on a confession site, a place where people go to talk about all the horrible things they did to other people and confess them anonymously. Uh, and uh, he found that uh, after analyzing thousands of these uh, posts, that when the site changed from a hard to read, disfluent uh, design like this one, light on dark, to a much more fluent site, that the confessions uh, became much more revealing. People were more willing to give up their secrets when the site was more fluent. Uh, another group of scientists had people choose between two phones. They read a description, looked at photos, and only 17% weren't able to choose. Then they changed the font that people uh, read the description in to this sort of a uh, little bit harder to read uh, embossed italic font, still very legible, uh, but then 40% couldn't decide. The difficulty in processing that information translated into difficulty in deciding. Uh, and one scary study showed that people were less likely to follow really important medical instructions if the font was hard to read. Now that's, that seems incredible, but uh, that's uh, what happens because it looks difficult, so it is difficult. Uh, the classic uh, fluency experiment as University of Minnesota had people estimate how long it would take to perform a simple exercise. The half that saw that exercise described in aerial fonts said it would take eight minutes. The half that, said, uh, that saw it in this sort of brushy font, still perfectly legible, same size, estimated 15 minutes. Exact same text, but it looked almost twice as hard for those people to do. So clearly, you want to make things uh, as simple as possible for your, on your customer's brain. Use simple fonts, uh, very easy to redesign, simple text, and so on. Uh, uh, one uh, important point here, if it's not motivation uh, on your landing page in particular, but I'll, elsewhere in your marketing, it's probably some kind of friction. So uh, to sum up, you want to build your slide, you want to align with gravity, that is what your customer's needs are, you want to nudge them, in a way that gets their attention and starts them moving down the slide. You want to maximize uh, the angle, the slope, uh, with conscious and non-conscious motivators, keeping in mind that non-conscious motivators are almost always going to be cheaper than conscious motivators. And finally, you want to minimize friction, both real and imaginary, uh, because minimizing friction is almost always cheaper than doing anything else to increase motivation. So, uh, if you remember just one thing from our time here today, uh, change is constant. We see it in communications, we see it in media, everybody's watching things on three screens now. 
Uh, we've got these new megatrends coming along. Our, we were just at South by, and uh, uh, virtual reality is huge. Uh, big data is still out there. Uh, people are getting their arms around that. Uh, mobile hasn't played out yet. But the one thing that has not changed in 50,000 years is the human brain. That's what scientists call the period of behavioral modernity. Uh, and uh, you will convert better by working with your customer's brain and the way it works. Thanks.